Okay, well, welcome everybody to Solar Noon Tuesday. I'm Jay Warmke with solarpvtraining.com. And um, the format of this program, what we do typically is we'll go ahead and walk through the news of the week, or in this case, the last couple of weeks in the solar industry. Then I try and highlight upcoming uh, webinars, conferences, things like that, that are of interest to our group. And then we will um, go ahead and deep dive into an item uh, topic for uh, discussion. And this week's topic, we're going to be talking about some indications that the price of electricity from the utilities uh, looks like it's going to be increasing pretty dramatically. So we'll jump on in and just also part of the format, we do have quite a number of people on Zoom at the moment, and hopefully they'll be able to interject some uh, comments and, and questions. And uh, so that's the format. All right. So let's jump on into the news this week. It's been about two years since the Inflation Reduction Act was made into law, the IRA, and it's... Um, there's a recent report from a company called E2, which is an industry consulting firm, to talk about the effect that this um, legislation has had on the industry, as well as on our society in general. Uh, the IRA, according to the report, has prompted about 334 major renewable energy projects, creating about 110,000 <laughs> new jobs uh, as part of the uh, as part of that, um, E2 uh, also suggests that for every dollar of public funding that has been spent uh, on from the IRA, it's generated about $3 in private investment. While there was a, sec a separate report from MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that uh, indicated that the number that they found was closer to $5.5 of private investment for every uh, $1 of public funds spent. Now, the largest recipients of this money from the IRA, uh, as far as the states are concerned, Michigan, number one, and um, actually uh, followed by Georgia, South Carolina, Texas, uh, Nor uh, North Carolina, Ohio, and Tennessee. In fact, traditionally, red districts have benefited, according to the report, quite dramatically um, from the IRA. About 60% of all of the public funds have gone to uh, those districts, and 85% of all of the private investments have gone to congressional districts that are held by Republicans, which is interesting since not a single Republican voted for the IRA, which... Um, uh, read into that what you will. And perhaps this is the reason why um, there's been a movement amongst a number of GOP uh, legislators to try and repeal the IRA. And a group of 18 Republican congressmen have sent a letter to House Speaker Mike um, Johnson asking him to uh, preserve the act. Um, quoting from the letter, they said prematurely repealing energy tax credits, particularly those used to justify investments for um, projects that already broke ground, would undermine private investment and stop development that is already ongoing. A full repeal would create a worst case scenario where we would have spent billions of dollars, taxpayer dollars, and received next to nothing in return. So that was their project. Um, there. I'm messing with my audio here. All right. So um, last week, uh, last Monday, in fact, President Biden more than doubled the amount of solar cells that can be imported into the United States without incurring tariffs. Uh, they've raised the limit there from five gigawatts to 12 and a half gigawatts. Now, these tariffs were put in place in 2018, originally setting the limitation at about two and a half gigawatts, but that was exceeded. Uh, the Biden administration increased it to five gigawatts. And then in June of this year, the imports uh, exceeded the five gigawatts, so they've raised it to 12 and a half. Now, the justification for this has been that essentially the IRA and all of the provisions it has for domestic manufacturing has increased domestic production of solar modules uh, pretty dramatically, but solar cells have not kept up. 
but solar cells are actually required in order to make the modules. So they're trying to increase the imports of cells so that it will support the domestic module manufacturing um, process. About 80% uh, of the world's solar cells um, are uh, manufactured in China. Um, of course, <laughs> it seems like everything's manufactured in China. Roughly 78 gigawatts of U.S. manufacturing capacity uh, have been announced uh, to come online by 2027 uh, as a result of the provisions in the IRA. That's a seven-fold increase over the capacity of manufacturing of solar modules previous, uh, prior to the IRA. However, Clean Energy Associates, which is a um, industry consulting group, projects that really only about 40 gigawatts of manufacturing capacity will actually come online. And that's about seven gigawatts less than what will be needed for domestic installations. Um, so I guess they're projecting only about half of those that have been announced will actually come to be. U.S. wind industry hit a record generation in the month of April of this year, actually alone surpassing coal as the second leading fuel uh, for generating electricity, uh, exceeded only by natural gas. Now, wind installed capacity has grown from 2.4 gigawatts in 2000 to over 150 gigawatts in April of 2024. Coal generation, on the other hand, during that same period of time has fallen from 315 gigawatts of, of capacity, of generating capacity, to about 177 gigawatts. And renewable energy, which included wind, solar, and hydro, surpassed coal as the second largest source of electricity in 2020. Now, this year, wind and solar without hydro is expected to exceed coal as the second um, largest generating source. And there's a lot of competition entering into the energy storage market. Now, this is one of the very fastest growing sectors within our industry, and it's about to become a bit more competitive. In 2022, there were five firms that controlled about 62% of all of the global manufacturing capacity of battery energy storage systems, referred to as BESS, B-E-S-S. Um, in 2023, those companies' shares fell from 62% down to 47%. Of the top 10 vendors, six are Chinese firms, and China actually installed most of the battery systems of any nation globally in 2023. Uh, Tesla overtook industry leader SunGrow to take the number one position uh, with about a 15% market share. Chinese firm SunGrow is now the second largest producer of, of best systems, followed by the Chinese state-owned organization, uh, the CRRC, and U.S. manufacturer Fluence is following that in fourth place. And then there's another Chinese manufacturer called HyperStrong in fifth place. And that's the news that I show from the solar industry for the past week. Anybody have any comments or, or questions on any of that before we jump into the events of the day or the week? Diane, where's so, uh, where was your boy hanging out before all this happened? He must be talking to somebody else. <laughs> he was where? Uh, hey, Mike, you're talking to us here. When all that stuff went down? Yeah. Was he staying down there with somebody or something? Yeah, he was. And then uh, I went and got him, brought him back. And so I told him, hey, so we're going to get up a line. So I'm going to get up a line. There we go. I think I got that. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, everybody hit hit mute. Um Okay, so let's jump into the uh, events of the week. Um, there's a conference on today at two o'clock regarding drones. So drones in the PV industry and how that will make uh, life better for you. On August 22nd at 1130, there's a, a webinar on uh, energy transition, the upcoming energy transition at 1130 Eastern time. All of these are Eastern time. Then um, unlocking the ITC domestic content bonus credits. 
so that's on August, um, let's see, August 28th, I guess. I, I have it written down here, the 22nd. I better double check that. Uh, yeah, oh, that is the August 22nd. All right, then August 28th is um, the power controls in the NEC. That's going to be at 2 p.m. So those are the webinars I have. Now, we do have our online courses uh, and some in-person courses. So if you want to check those out at solarpvtraining.com, that's always a good thing, our shameless plug. And uh, we should be coming out with the... Um, Next edition here of the Understanding Photovoltaics, hold that thing up there. We're in the final second editing period, so we'll, uh, those should be available here sh soon. So if you're an instructor wanting to use these in your classroom, just send me a note and we'll send you a copy once they're available so you can look at it for your classroom. And that is the events that I have coming up. Um, anybody have any questions or any comments you want to add for the group? Before we jump in, I'm give you just, just a there second. There was a comment about um, drones and solar. Somebody just, is. was there a short version of what's the hypothesis around that? Oh, you mean for the webinar about drones, Paul? Is that what you're yeah, asking? Yeah, I just, I, I, I have a drone. I operate a drone. I like my drone. I have solar. <laughs> I operate solar. The two of them have never been introduced. And oh, yeah. so not quite sure what the hypothesis is. Yeah, well, at utility scale, there are actually quite a lot of applications that are being used for drones. Um, one is um, they're using drones fitted with um, uh, infrared type detection to look for hotspots on the on the modules so that you can um, very quickly look over to see if there's an issue. It'll also talk about, you know, if there's maybe a arcing, I think the connection is less clear. So you can find those hotspots on the panel. I've also read articles where they're using drones to clean the um, uh, to clean the panels. So um, you know they'll spray them uh, from that. Uh, there's people using drones for uh, inventorying, you know, so I guess uh, I know there's a company that uses them to create a database of information about solar panels, how many, uh, what's there. So they go in and add that together. Um, you know, a lot of things, inspection of facilities, things like that. So instead of having to walk over the entire surface, you can use them for that. Uh, we also have seen where you can use drones for um, site assessment, you know, to go in, uh, especially I could see like on a commercial situation where you want to take a look at the roof, but it's not an easy access type thing. So you send the drone up and look around just to see, you know, on one of those big flat roofs to see what's available. So does that make sense, Paul? That makes perfect sense. Now I got to go find an attachment to spray uh, melting stuff on top of my, whatever you call that, uh, de-icing on all yeah. of my panels in the future. Oh. Yeah, they do use that. Uh, I've seen it for uh, wind turbines as well. You know, you uh, they they add that for the de-icing exactly for the blades on wind turbines. They'll go up and spray those in the winter time. So this uh, is this is absolutely my number one priority now going forward. <laughs> okay, well, you better get your license. I assume you've got a license if you're going to do this commercially. There are some pretty um, pretty no, severe fines just, just for fun. That's all. <laughs> okay. I always I always find it funny that you can get severely penalized if you fly a drone without a license. But I could. I could walk in with an AK-47 and everybody's fine. Well, it, so. it was really funny. We had a change in draw. This is off topic, but we had change in uh, the drone restrictions in our area during the Republican National Convention. And we called about it and they said, well, you can fly your drone if you want it to be shot down. Oh. And that was the, uh, <laughs> that's right. Well, that's that sort of gets into that old thing about the your right to swing your arms ends when it connects with my nose. So, uh, yeah, you exactly. know, that's uh, <laughs> so that's that's fine. All right. Well, let me jump ahead here, and we'll I, get. I wanted, uh, yeah. Can I get on the agenda? This is Harvey Wasserman. Yeah. Hey, Harvey. To, how you doing? I just wanted to have a, a a minute or two to talk about plans for Los Angeles. Okay. Well, that's good. It's a good time if you want to just shoot on in here before we get into the high cost of electricity. Go for it. Okay. So uh, I live in L.A., and um, uh, many of you probably know that L.A. has a municipal. And uh, we're getting killed in California by the PUC on the rate structures. I'm sure many of you know they're doing everything they can to um, uh, undermine solar. 
but the CPUC does not have reign over over the DWP. And uh, what we want to do is uh, form a rate structure uh, that will um, accelerate and really make a, a very rapid push to put solar panels on all the buildings in LA. Uh, there, there's a huge number of flat roofed uh, warehouses in LA. Uh, whenever you fly in, it's you know square miles of them, and we we believe we could uh, rapidly. Uh, if the rate structure was adjusted, um, uh, solarize a very large uh, section of the uh, electric supply in LA by covering these rooftops. Uh, we also have Dodger Stadium crypto. There's a, a, a pretty good number of very large stadium parking lots in LA. And of course, the Olympics is coming up in 28. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we need help with uh, restructuring uh, the rate system in, in the DWP, uh, where we have, as I say, unique opportunity because it's a muni. The DWP also owns 10% of the Palo Verde nuclear plant. And because of what Newsom has done, the governor, we uh, the entire state is being assessed to pay for Diablo Canyon. And so we want to we want to make an issue of that. So those are the prongs of the push. We, we really want to accelerate this push now that the Olympics are coming. And uh, that Diablo Canyon is such an incredible risk of uh, being surrounded by earthquakes, et cetera. So anybody who wants to communicate with me, I mean, the number one job will be to go in front of L.A. City Council and the DWP with a plan to restructure the rates in L.A. so that we can make um, uh, solar um, uh, way more attractive and more, way more doable. Uh, I, have a, I have a house I've been holding off solar putting solar on because they require you to hook up to the grid and as you know they've killed uh, net metering for all intents and purposes in LA uh, and in California well so, Harvey uh, do you know do you know if your municipal there in LA um, allows for community solar because I've seen a lot of community well, solar there, projects on urban warehouses that that look very promising there, well there there has been a whole community solar pro uh, community uh, CCA, uh, movement in the state, uh, but they've undermined it. Uh, certainly, PG&E uh, has undermined it. I'm not clear on what the what the rules are in LA. That's going to be part of our our attack here. So uh, you know, uh, the the public opinion in LA would be very supportive um, uh, of doing this. We just have to make the numbers work, and then accelerate the push. Well, do you have so, an email? Uh, do you have an email that people can I do contact indeed. you at? My email is very easy. It's solartopia, S-O-L-A-R-T-O-P-I-A, at Gmail or at M-E. M-E is better for big documents. Okay. But um, please do. And my phone number, I'll give you my phone number. Well, it's, it's going to be out on YouTube. So uh, if you want to give your phone number, that's up to you. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. 614 Seven three six one four is Columbus, Ohio. Weirdly enough, six one four seven three eight three six four six. So we we need people with expertise in rate structuring, and as you mentioned, in community solar um, opportunities. But we we can do this in L.A. We we would have the political uh, oomph behind us to do this if we can make the numbers work and really accelerate it and make the Olympics a goal. We could, we could uh, in four years, I mean, I don't have to tell you the sunlight in LA is very potent. There are not many trees um, uh, that are shading these very large warehouses. And there are tons of them. Yeah. And you've so, also got a very high, I don't know about your municipal, but California's electric rate, I think. Second I just in was, the country. It's like second 34, in the 34 yes, point something a kilowatt hour. It's obscene. It's yeah. really obscene. And we ha and part of the ulterior motive, of course, is to shut the nuke. Because, uh, you know, we had a deal in 2016. I'm sure you're all aware of a great phase out plan. We had Governor Jerry Brown, Lieutenant Governor Newsom, who's now stabbing us in the back. We had the unions, the local um, um, governments, the, the assembly, the PUC, and even the utility signed on to this deal in 2016. Yeah. And then in 2022, out of the blue, Newsom came in and destroyed the deal. 
and this, and um, uh, this is important actually, he forced a $1.4 billion loan um, on, uh, that, that, that could be uh, forgiven for PG&E to keep Diablo open. Now, finally, the legislature, which was a, really attacked uh, in a blitzkrieg in 22, the legislature has now refused uh, the last 400 million. So they're vulnerable now. And, you know, if we can get Diablo shut and with the, uh, uh, you know, we have 1.8 million solar rooftops in L.A. We have 70,000 people working in the solar in the in the rooftop installation business. And he's already cost 14,000 jobs with this with, by killing that metering in the state. I mean, it's an it's an absolute disaster. Right. I think what what you're pointing to is the uh, what is net net metering 3.0 out there in California, which basically reduced net metering by I think it was 74 percent. So, yeah, they killed it. I mean, it's 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 absurd. dramatic. Yeah. One and of also the they have a they have a tax. They have a tax on on utility bills now that's completely uh, disconnected with uh, consumption. Uh -huh. It's a flat tax yep. uh, on utility bills. It's insane. Yeah, I think what we're finding, and you're, you're, this is a good lead up to the discussion that we're having today, because um, we, we did have a discussion a while back during one of these sessions about the concept, and I know this is something that that initially sounds a little bit odd, but it's worth discussion to say, are we at a moment when we should consider nationalizing the electric grid? because most developed nations have some sort of nationalized grid. Um, and, and there are a lot of factors here, certainly a lot of problems to try and make this happen. But our grid structure is such, we're already seeing the federal government investing literally trillions of dollars in the transmission system because private industry has failed us there. Uh, we see a huge amount of corruption um, in the utility model, we see this in Ohio with um, First Energy yeah. paying off, you know, literally millions of dollars to state legislators, people going to jail, um, you know, so so there's, uh, I know there was a, um, an interesting, uh, John Oliver did a story about utilities corruption, um, and, uh, and that that's, permeating. We're also starting to see great disparities between different regions where California can pay 35 cents a, a kilowatt hour and, and you know, someplace like Arkansas paying only 12 cents. That as, as a nation doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, so, but the other issue, California is a good example. You would think, and they have been traditionally very liberal in their um, attitude towards renewable energy, you know, trying to promote renewable energy uh, in a lot of different ways. And then the Public Utilities Commission turns around and is undermining many of these uh, steps uh, with the killing of net metering, you know, and, right. and things like that. And, and it's important to understand that the Public Utilities Commissions um, are appointed, you know, they're a political body. Um, so, so it's hard for me to get my head around why, um, the legislature or the governor in California would appoint. I can people. tell you. Okay. All right. Real quick. And then we'll jump into the pricing. Why, well, Newsom, why? Thought he was, Newsom thought he was going to run for president. Uh -huh. And so in April of 22, we, we were sailing along to shut Diablo this unit one this year and unit two next year. It was a beautiful, beautiful plan. And uh, all of a sudden, in April of 22, Newsom uh, was apparently bought by, by PG&E and had presidential aspirations and went into and strong armed the legislature. And a lot of the legislators are really pissed uh, because they were they were really manhandled. And we, we believe it was because Newsom had presidential aspirations and wanted the backing of the nuclear industry. So uh, we'll see now. But as I said, the DWP is a separate entity, and uh, we, and we do have a relatively liberal mayor, although she hasn't given us the time of day. But um, uh, so th yes, everything you said is accurate. Um, um, uh, but w L LA could become a special case. Okay. Uh, we, well, hopefully we people can jump in and help you out, and I will. Uh, um, 
I kept thinking when you're saying Newsom is bought, I should have jumped in and said allegedly or whatever, you know. So, so Harvey has, yeah, has I come strong from Ohio. <laughs> That's the, right. the, the price tag of the Ohio legislature to <laughs> give the billion dollar bailout to Perry and Davis Vesey and kill renewables in the state was $61 million. Yeah. Just yep. Seth Price. And now he's in, uh, Larry Householder is in prison for 20 years. He was the, he was the speaker. Yep. Okay, well, let me jump into the high cost of uh, power because as as we're kind of now we're kind of in an ominous situation here where we're seeing some of the political issues that are uh, that are out there that uh, are impacting this industry, and uh, so I just thought I would highlight some of those here. So, um, so when when we look at the prices of electricity. Um, the average price of electricity here over the last, uh, since 2018 or 1918, so last 40 years or so, we've seen this, this average price rise. I think it ends up being just under 3% a year on average, but it doesn't happen in a smooth curve. Um, we get jumps periodically. We're currently in the middle of another jump, um, pretty dramatic jump, but, um, if you look at how much it's increased year on year, uh, we've we've seen some years where um, it's uh, as much as 10% uh, a year increasing. And I think we're moving into another period of time there. I know when we do solar assessments, they often suggest you put a 2% uh, escalating clause in there. Some people put a 3% because that's what we've seen for the last few years. Uh, and as I'll allude to a little bit later on, this always has seemed a little bit strange to me, at least in recent years, because as renewable energy gets um, more and more uh, prevalent, becomes a larger share of the fuel source for the grid, and renewable energy prices keep dropping as far as the cost of producing this energy, you would imagine that the cost of electricity would decline. That's what you would assume would happen if free market were involved uh, in this. But as we see, this is a regulated market. It's a politically uh, intertwined marketplace. So I think free market has almost nothing to do with what we see happening here at the macro scale, at the larger scale. Um, so that's something to look at. So who sets these prices. Who sets the retail price of electricity? This is a regulated industry. So who's responsible for this? Um, it, it, it is not a free market thing. So typically what happens is the public utilities commissions, state by state, are the ones who are setting these prices. And, and back in my days in the telecom industry, people always used to joke, you know, it's like, I want a 5% increase. So I'm going to ask for 10. The legislator will cut it to five and I get what I want. You know, it's a very cozy relationship there where the lobbyists for the industry go in, talk to the Public Utilities Commission and negotiate what kind of price rises they're going to get. Um, when you look at how the Public Utility Commissions are actually uh, selected, the people who sit on these commissions, they're for the most part appointed by the governor. Um, it could be appointed by appointed by the General Assembly or the legislature in the state. Virginia, South Carolina do that, uh, and then a few of the states have actual elections uh, of the public utility commissioners. Uh, you see all of those in green, but most of them are appointed positions. And um, therefore, clearly, if a politician is going to appoint this person, it is a political position. I know there was an interesting um, podcast, uh, I think it was called Power Play, uh, that was put on by uh, WOSU, the public radio station at Ohio State University, about the crisis that we had here, uh, the scandal, the first energy scandal here in Ohio where, as Harvey just pointed out, they paid, First Energy essentially paid $61 million um, in political donations to, um, to folks within the state legislature, channeled primarily through uh, uh, Speaker of the House, Householder. And, um, and it was a pay-to-play scheme. 
they got what amounted to, I believe the estimates were around $2 billion worth of uh, benefits out of it for their $61 million. Number of people went to jail over that. But then subsequent to that, um, the governor uh, appointed a lobbyist for First Energy to be the head of the Public Utilities Commission. How how impartial that it, that individual will, would be um, is suspect, at least in my opinion. All right, so who sets the wholesale cost of electricity? Well, it is in large measure determined by the regional uh, transmission organizations. And you can see with this map over my shoulder here, the United States is broken up into a number of regional transmission organizations or RTOs. Uh, Casio with California out there, then there's the Northwest Southwest. ERCOT, Texas is, is kind of independent, except um, isolated rather than independent, I would say. And the one that I'm going to talk about in particular is PJM. That's near and dear to my heart, sitting here in Ohio. Um, and it basically goes all the way from New York to Chicago. You can see there are a couple of islands of PJM up there in northern Indiana and up around the Chicago area. So PJM is the um, RTO for this region. So how? what is an RTO? Who runs the RTO? Remember, this is an administrative, quasi-legislative, quasi-executive branch kind of organization, but it's pretty much a membership organization. Um, essentially, the folks who are interested in what's happening in the transmission authority can join and become members, and they kind of own it and control it. Um, so members primarily are utilities and power plant owners. You know, they can be solar power plant, they can be wind, or they can be fossil fuel, or they can be nuclear. And if you look through the list of who is the member of, for instance, PJM, it is largely um, utilities, subsidiaries of utilities, power plant owners. A lot of solar companies were in there too, by the way or solar developers, I should say. I suspect that a small installer is not going to spend the time or energy to be a member of the RTO. Um, so the membership then nominates and elects the board. So so the governance, like any, any membership organization, is drawn from the membership of that organization. And I guess the insidious nature, and I don't want to paint this like everybody's out to do something nefarious, but they're, but it's just the nature of a membership organization is a bias towards protecting the interest of the established players because they're the ones who run the organization, you know? <laughs> Oops. Okay. So, um, so they, are going to vote for that. And, and who are the established players in this particular industry? Well, the established players are the utilities and they're the, um, the, the existing power plant operators, um, which traditionally until very recently have been the fossil fuel industry or the nuclear industry, as, as Harvey was pointing out in some of his comments. So by its very nature, it, it, you cannot assume that an RTO is there to look out for the interests of the public. Um, they are primarily there to look out for the interests of their membership. And their membership is the established order of the current grid as it exists. So I just want you to sort of keep that in mind. And, I, and there's nothing evil or whatever. Uh, there could be, but there's but this is just the nature of these kind of organizations. Uh, if you join a trade organization, they, I mean, their whole motivation is to look out for that particular industry. Um, that's that's why you would join. So um, typically the RTOs do not own power plants. Their members do, but they don't. Uh, but they do uh, exercise an extraordinary amount of control over the power generation. Um, RTOs typically decide which generators will run at what time and how much power they will generate. 
they'll use different mechanisms for that. Some will do least cost. Some will do, um, you know, deal with how much ramp time there is on that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things in that mix that they look at. They also, in theory, well, by their name, manage the transmission system within their jurisdiction. And if you remember, or it's sounding like we're recapping something we talked about before, but basically the grid has three major levels of um, activities within it to get power from the power plant to your home. There's generation, and generation in, in the past has traditionally been um, the um, uh, power plants, coal power plants for a long while were the dominant. Today, natural gas power plants are the dominant. We're seeing a, a surge of, uh, of renewable energy. In fact, this year, 95% of all of the power added to the grid will be wind and solar and batteries. So we're in this transition. Um, so those are the power plants. That's the generation. And it can be owned by the utility. It can be owned by a developer. It can be owned by a municipality. It could be owned by the government. Um, you know, the federal government owns a, a number of generating facilities, such as the Tennessee Valley Authority and things like that. Um, okay, so those are the generation. Then you take the power from those generating plants and trans transmit it to the substations, those those caged looking high-tech uh, little power units that people break into and try and steal the copper and get electrocuted, right? They're, they're in your neighborhood, they're at the edge of your town. The high speed, the transmission portion are very high voltage systems that take power over long distances. The distribution system is typically owned by your local utility, takes that power from the substation, steps down the voltage and then takes that to your home or business. The distribution lines are all of the power lines you see around your neighborhoods and the like. Um, what we're in the process of doing is moving away from that model of large centralized power plants, long transmission distances and localized distribution to a distributed energy system where the homeowner or the business owner can generate power where they are and use it. Where, they, where, where it's generated, and solar is ideal for this. Um, there you avoid the large generation plants owned by somebody else other than the customer, and you, um, you avoid the high transmission costs, the transmission over distance and the voltage drop that's as a result of that. And a lot of these players are feeling like their um, economic model is, is existentially threatened because of this transition. Because in the past, I could not build a coal power plant. I could not build a nuclear power plant to get myself that electricity. But I can sure build a solar array on my home. And I can do it at a cost that is probably less than um, the wholesale cost that the utility experiences. I guess um, essentially the barriers of entry have gone away and I can do it competitively with my local utility. Uh, a utility scale system might cost say a third of the cost of a homeowner system. So on average, it's gonna be about $3 a watt to, um, to install a system on my home. That's my retail cost. The utility, because of the size of their systems can do it for about a dollar a watt. But the wholesale cost of electricity is about a third of the retail cost. So, you know, we're kind of on an even competitive level. And so the utilities or the entrenched powers don't particularly like that because our their customers can now compete against them on an even footing. That's not good for business, especially when you do business, when you're lousy at the business that you're doing. Um, if, if the only way that you can keep your customer is forcing them to be your customer, I would say you don't necessarily deserve to be in business, but um, that's not for me to decide, I guess. Um, so they manage the transmission system and they run the billing systems, payments, uh, and all of this. Well, within the RTO, they will argue that customers can enter into bilateral agreements. Basically, if AEP wants to buy power from Fred Jones, who has a solar um, farm, 
they can negotiate it between the two of them. But energy prices set by the RTO are essentially what they're looking to for guidance as to what these prices should be. So, so they do have an influence on wholesale prices and a significant influence. So it's, um, it's, it's, if you're saying this industry group, this association gets to set the wholesale cost of electricity, I would say by its very nature, that's a conflict of interest. Um, essentially, um, when we ran industry trade association meetings, it was a big deal to say, hey, guys, you can't come in here and start talking about prices. You can't come meet as a group and set the wholesale cost of things. That's that's price fixing. That's bad. You know, the antitrust people are going to jump all over that. But this is a baked in established way that we do this is you let the industry association come in and set their prices. So that's that's going to create a bias towards the producers, for sure, for sure. All right, um, since I've given a lot of opinions here, I'll also throw it open. If anybody jumps in or wants to jump in as I'm going through this, feel free, because I would love you to disagree or pat me on the back for being so insightful. So, all right, um, utilities operating within the RTO have another thing that they have to deal with, which is to meet capacity requirements. Um, so essentially what they're looking at is because they can't store electricity on the grid. So you can't just say, I'm going to have our strategic gold reserve or a strategic oil reserve, and we're going to set aside this stuff in case there's an emergency. They say, okay, we're going to, we're going to pay you producers to give us the assurance that when we need this power, it will be available. So it's almost like first option on that power. So for planning purposes, they typically plan for, you know, peak capacity plus a reserve, you know, plus a certain margin. And so what they're saying is, okay, on a hot day in the middle of August, um, we're going to need X amount of power and we're going to need uh, and let's put it, let's bump it by 15%, 18%, 20%, just in case. And we're going to make sure that capacity is available to meet those demands. And we'll pay for that. We'll pay you essentially an option on that. And it can be purchased days or years in advance. So what prompted this discussion, at least in my mind, is... PJ&M just held their, their auction for 2025-2026, and this headline sort of caught my eye uh, from Renewable Energy uh, World. It said, oh, that's not good. Energy prices at PJM's capacity auction skyrocketed nine times, ninefold. So what we saw, I think I've got it. Oh, it's, uh, it's right up above there. Yeah, what we saw here is that the 2024-2025 price um, for this option, for this capacity, was $28.92, and 2025-2026 was $269.92. So in order for PJ&M to secure the power that they believe they're going to need a year from now, they had to pay almost 10 times as much as they had to pay last year. Um, so, so they anticipate just this alone is going to prompt a 29% increase in electric prices within the PJM um, region in 2025. So, you know, we're sitting here anticipating a two or 3% price increase and just this one event has just prompted some of these analysts to say, hey, get ready for almost a 30% increase in your electric bill prices within this region. Hey, Jay, um, it's, yeah. Paul, I just have a, two questions. Um, you talked about, I don't understand the nonlinearity here. There's a 10% change in their costs, which is leading to a 29% increase in local rates. Oh, no, local it's not it's not 10%. It's 900%. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nine times the price. I see. For these options. Yeah, that's it's easy to see jump that, but no, they're 
there and and the reasons for it um the reasons why the cost of these options basically um went up is maybe even going to increase this number further maybe yeah. not in 2025 but later I think an observation i think it, it's for those of us who are advocates of the topics of this regular meeting uh, it's sometimes hard to be sympathetic but just to be sympathetic for a moment as the experiment here you know that unlike every other provider of goods and services that i know of the electric company so to speak and the water company both of those organizations have a consumer demand for infinite capacity with zero lead time uh -huh. and i spent most of my career in medical devices if my customer said i want an infinite number of ultrasound machines uh, and I want them available on my doorstep with no capacity, I would just laugh at them and tell them how expensive that would be. Yep. I wonder, you know, the buying of these options is a way of having inventory available just in case. Yeah, and, that's kind of the whole purpose of it yeah. is to say, you know what, we know that there's going to be this. So we need to we need to have this capacity available and we're going to pay for it. You yeah, know, yeah. we're going to pay for you to have these plants standing by ready to go, you know, if we need them. And it's not totally nuts is my point. It, it You could argue about whether the coefficient on the equation is the right coefficient, but yeah. to say that I need to plan for more capacity is actually something we'd be laughing at them about if they had weren't doing it. Right. Well, and I'm not arguing that, that the there's a problem with the process here, that having that capacity. I'm just saying that it's an indicator that the cost is going to be 10 times what it was last year, which indicates there's a problem with the supply demand uh, mix. Um, and part of the problem here, remember, their whole goal is to support entrenched interests. So I just found it interesting. This was the mix of the options they're buying, essentially, gas being half of it, nuclear and coal. You get down to wind and solar, they're, they're just not giving them, they have not been overly supportive, at least within PJM. So I know what it would mean to buy an option for coal or natural gas. What would it mean to buy an option for solar? I mean, I, you, I can buy coal and I can have a whole bunch of coal on a rail yard on a siding or have a contract to have it delivered. What is the equivalent of that in the solar space? Yeah, I think what it is, is um, it, it has nothing to do with how big a pile of coal you have. It's your generating capacity. Like if you've got a one megawatt plant or whatever. And my assumption, although it wasn't clear in the reading, but this was what I was assuming, it's not precluding you from selling it to somebody else. It's just that when PJM calls and said, I want that power, they get it. Yeah. Now, the person you were selling it to doesn't get it. Um, so that causes a problem right there, I would think, because it's not like these things live in isolation, yeah. um, you know, so, so it, uh, and maybe there, maybe some of these power plants sit idle uh, until you have the most peak load requirement. Uh, and that's expensive, you know, to have capacity that's not being used for most of the time. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, so what's causing this? In fact, I was talking to a utility, just one of the linemen guys, and he was very concerned about this a couple of years ago. He says, you know, if they're shutting down all these coal power plants and I'm not seeing anything being built to replace them, um, that's problematic. And, and those chickens are coming home to roost. Um, we're seeing a dramatic um, increase, and I've got these in a little more depth here. There's a lack of transmission lines and that tends to mean that there's a lack of flexibility in moving available power from one region to another. So, so that causes problems. So this is, again, that disruption between supply and demand. Um, long waits for approval. This has been a huge, huge issue, especially here in PJ&M. Increased load demand. Uh, we'll touch on some of that. And then new rules from FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is exacerbating the problem as far as the utility is concerned. So, so what is the plant retirement? Well, we just see that the coal power plants, of course, are being shut down. They're just being shut down. That industry is no longer economically viable. The, the plants are old. They were built in the 50s and 60s. They're past their sell-by date. Um, and they cost three times as much to operate as a brand new solar array. So, so when you're looking at how do I cut costs, you know, from a, 
from a management standpoint, first thing you're going to do is shut down your old coal power plants. So they're showing that this will just simply continue. That would be fine if we were replacing them with something else uh, at the same rate or a faster rate than what they're being shut down at. But as you'll see, that's not happening. So, um, so that's problematic. And these things are going to be shut down regardless. So that's going to have an impact, at least in the short term. And the short term might be the next decade or so as far as uh, plants and uh, as far as prices of this. But we've seen half of all the capacity just in you know, a 10, 15 year period um, disappearing. Uh, then we get into lack of transmission lines. And this is where the Infrastructure Act um, put in quite a lot of money to uh, deal with this long speed transmission. And I just found this map kind of interesting when you look at where where is the value add when you start adding additional transmission? And the, the higher the number for those connection points, the more value uh, there is in, in expanding that. So we see quite a lot there in the Northeast. Um, of course, down in Texas, just connecting ERCOT to the rest of the world, well, connecting Texas to the rest of the world would be a lovely thing. So there's a lot of value there as well. And, and somebody needs to pay for it. Well, who's going to pay for it? You know, I mean, the power, that would almost like saying, are you going to make Ford pay for the highways? You know, it's to their advantage because their cars are going to go out on the highways, but they don't, it, it's almost, it's impractical. So who's going to pay for it? Well, the federal government ends up paying for a large amount of it. And, um, you know, so if if we're already paying for a major component of the grid and in the other areas, they're not doing so well. Maybe we should just sort of, you know, take control of all of it. Uh, spoken like a, a true liberal lefty socialist commie, right? Um, okay, so interconnection times, really long. Um, in ERCOT, it's an average of three and a half years now. So if I wanted to replace one of those coal power plants with a big solar array, I would have to apply to ERCOT or not to ERCOT, but to uh, PJM. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be three and a half years before they give me an answer. And they're also changing the rules during that period of time. And many of these things become unaffordable during that period of time. So you can see just how much that wait list has, uh, has grown um, over, over the past few years. And the majority of that is renewable energy. Uh, in 2022, I didn't have 2023 available, but just that little sliver of of gray in the middle there is is gas, you know, gas and I guess a little bit of coal, not really. Um, it's all wind, solar, and batteries basically, and these things are being delayed, and they're being delayed pretty pretty dramatically. So we have a combination of power plants being closed, new power plants are coming online, but not fast enough, and those people who want to bring these power plants online are seeing increasingly long waits in order to get that paperwork approved. And then we're seeing increased load demand. And this increased load demand is for a lot of reasons. Um, it, the, the load demand on the grid has been pretty stable for the last two decades. Uh, increase in demand's been offset with energy efficiencies. But all of a sudden we're seeing sort of the perfect storm coming in here with uh, the transition to electric vehicles, which takes transportation and puts it into the electric world. Uh, we're seeing um, the advent of artificial intelligence, uh, data centers, things of this nature, which are putting huge strains onto the grid. Uh, they're all based on electricity. They all need electricity. Um, then we're also uh, seeing, um, let's see, there was another thing that popped into my mind. I just lost it. Um, but anyway, we're, we're just seeing these huge, huge shifts towards the electrification of everything. And um, yeah, crypto, cryptocurrency, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, we have the AI and then, of course, crypto mining, which to me is... Uh, kind of like, I don't know, investing in tulips, but um, but there are a lot of people who are um, who are into that. So, and it's gonna be a thing. It's gonna generate uh, the need for electricity. So um, that's, that's gonna be an issue. So we're already there. We're retiring a certain amount. 
um, and we're not building and replacing it fast enough. And then on top of that, we're increasing our load demand. So that's going to be huge. And then FERC came in with a bunch of new rules and said, oh, you know what? We have this thing called climate change. We're seeing increasingly um, uh, disruptive weather events. Uh, we're seeing a, a volatile energy marketplace. They're looking at the numbers and saying we're, we're anticipating growth, uh, demand growth. So we're requiring that you put in uh, bigger budge factors, you know, more, more capacity sure. in your capacity auctions, things of that nature. And all of that then puts a strain on the existing um, systems. So all of this is pushing towards higher prices. Uh, there's a few notable items I just found here where we look in 2024, some price hikes going through Minnesota, five and a half percent, Oregon wanting a 17 percent increase in in. These are already approved by the uh, utility commissions in those states. New York, six percent, uh, North Carolina, 10, California, 13 percent. Everybody's favorite as California goes. So goes the nation. So um I found Ohio's interesting AAP 1% over the next four years. I will bet you money, dollars to donuts. They come back and want a revision to that, right? So then we, if we just looked at the historical process, we could be ex expecting, um, you know, a 3% increase per year kind of thing on this. So that's pushing prices up just following that kind of inflation. Um, so, so it's significant price um, pressure. California, as we mentioned earlier, is 34, almost 34 and a half cents. Hawaii is even higher, which you would expect as an island nation. U.S. average, I put Ohio in there because Ohio loves to be average. But if we're looking at a 29% increase in, in power prices in 2025, we're looking at 21 and a half cent uh, a kilowatt hour uh, here nationally on average um, within uh, within a year or so. So, you know, that's, that's going to be dramatic. People are going to um, have some serious sticker shock. Now, I think as Pete had mentioned in the earlier comments, every time the price goes up, my return on investment on my solar array goes up. You know, I get a better deal. So the assuming there's no legislation to prohibit it, which I wouldn't put outside the realm of, of possibility in some jurisdictions, there's going to be a, every price increase makes solar a better and better deal. Uh, so there's going to be tremendous pressure on our industry, on the solar industry, to uh, get out there and, and install. Um, we've seen most of the growth in recent years in utility scale solar. I think we're going to see a dramatic increase in residential systems. So we're running up against it. But does anybody have any comment uh, after after my semi-literal rant here about the pressure on prices? Give you just a second. Have you know? Okay, I must have covered everything perfectly. Oh, and and I guess the last thing I just sort of wanted to put out put out there is. Prices should be falling. So there's something wrong with this system. When we see the levelized cost of producing electricity is falling. It's falling for, for natural gas. It's holding steady for coal. But it's been falling dramatically for wind and solar. So, so there's something, something wrong. Oop, that's from previous one. So there's something wrong when we have a system that sees the cost of production falling, but the cost of the retail supply um, uh, rising dramatically. Somebody just put in there. Yeah, Al, you've got a, got your hand raised. You're on mute. The I can just see the legislature and other people in Ohio and probably other states looking at this big jump in electricity prices and blaming solar oh yeah for sure for I sure mean, it, it's hard to understand how you can blame solar but i'll bet they'll find a way and and i'm very concerned that that may drive changes in net metering and other things 
Yeah, I, th I think that's a fairly safe prediction. We saw that with the winter ice storms in Texas where they blamed wind turbines, yeah. um, you know, where when in fact it was the icing up of natural gas that was the main response. And um, so that is, uh, that's for sure. And we also see that they're blaming the closing of the coal power plants on all of these you know, um, EPA regulations, which have almost nothing to do with it, really. It's just that it's not economical to run them any longer. So, yep. Well, never let a good crisis go to waste. Somebody's going to use this to their political advantage for sure. So, yeah, Harvey, I see your hand raised there. Yeah. <clears throat> what about the domestic production of uh, solar panels? Um, oh, yeah. What's happening with that? Well, the domestic production has been incentivized by the um, IRA uh, with the 10% um, you know, tax credit. The problem has been the Chinese have ramped up production even more dramatically, and they subsidize that. So if you can buy a Chinese panel for 30% or 40% less than an American panel, then 10% doesn't do you a whole lot of incentive. So then the Biden administration has just raised the tariffs on imported from those countries to 50%. So they're trying to attack it with a with a combination of tariffs and incentives to try and spur the domestic. And we have seen a jump in domestic manufacturing uh, announcements. I tend to fall on in line with if the Chinese want to subsidize cheap panels, why don't we let them? And why don't we leapfrog ahead uh, into the world of perovskite and, and other technologies that have a lower barrier to entry in the production and let Chinese dominate the silicon manufacturing of panels and we're going to dominate the next generation. We're going to let them do copper wire and we're going to be wireless. You know, it's like it, that feels... Plus, most of the companies they're incentivizing to locate their plants here in the U.S. are Chinese manufacturers anyway. You know, they're just putting their plants here in the U.S. So, yeah, I mean, in theory, it's working, but I just hate trying to tax. It raises the price for everybody when you start putting these tariffs uh, in place. So, um, well, that's my, if we want to, I'm schizophrenic on it. If we want to start arguing as, as part of our Solarize LA by 2028, if we want to argue for a, a put production of solar panels in LA, what are we up against? Yeah, you're up against the fact that, uh, you know, just like China is cheaper than the US, Georgia is cheaper than California. So so you're going, the, the panel manufacturers will not locate in, in California. They will locate in low cost, um, states and they already are. Um, you know the the red states, southeastern Texas, huge for solar manufacturing now. Georgia, South Carolina. Um, so I I wouldn't. What you can argue for is localized installation, procurement, distribution. So there's a lot of jobs there in the installation. It's not something you can outsource. It's got to happen there locally. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't try and make the argument that L.A. is going to be the hotbed of manufacturing of solar panels. I just yeah. don't see that happening. Yeah. Chet. You're on mute, too. You coming in? Go ahead. Can you get that? There you go. So my question is, um, I was listening to some a builder and an electrician talk about the installation of batteries. They were saying that people are, and I don't know who people are, whether this is a solar installer or somebody else, but somebody was saying that the installation of a battery helps clean up the power in the, that comes into the system into the home yes is that correct yes it is and and but only the power that's actually being pulled from the battery so what they're basically saying is if you've got dirty power coming in from your ac source 
Right. And you then store it in the battery. When you regenerate that power, it's going to be cleaned up. All the sine waves and the voltage and all of that will be will be cleaner going out. Now, if you're exporting any of that power back to the grid, you got to dirty it up so that it matches the grid. And mm -hmm. that'll happen, you know, in your inverter. But um, but it does, it does make your power cleaner. Um, it can be done on a big scale as well. There are situations where um, whole microgrids have been serviced or the investment of a battery backup system has been put in place where AEP or some company is running their power through the battery, charging and then generating, charging and generating. So it's almost like a power wash kind of thing as it's moving through these large systems. And I think we're still going to see that happening more and more. Um, because you get harmonic distortions, you get voltage drops, you get, you know, some some problems with the sine wave uh, as power is out there interacting with a lot of these distributed systems and traveling over distance. So we can begin to use batteries, whether they're large centralized batteries or distributed batteries in all the electrical vehicles that are plugged in to clean up that power on the grid and help maintain it. And and but some of that's being done through the inverters now that have to be smart inverters, so to speak. Okay, but if you're not drawing from your battery, if you're just drawing from the grid, you have a battery that's sitting there idle, 100% yeah. charged. It's doing nothing. Okay. Yeah, unless you're feeding, unless you're channeling the power through that battery, you know, like charging and discharging at the same rate rather than bypassing it. But that's right. going to wear out your battery, you know, faster for sure. You know, it's like, right. it's like putting right. miles on your car. So, well, these were people with high end stereo systems and sophisticated lighting systems in homes talking about how dirty the power is that was coming in. Yeah. And that putting in a battery you know, cleans up the system. And that just didn't make any sense to me. Yeah, it so. would have to run through the batteries. In the past, I think the way you had to deal with that was through capacitors. Um, now what they're saying is, well, we don't have to do a capacitor where we charge it and discharge it. We can use a, we can use batteries. And yeah, but it's a cost. It's a cost element. You're, you're going to be, you're going to be running that battery almost like a standalone system. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Okay, well, I think we've come to the end here. I appreciate everybody's attention and hopefully we'll see you guys in two weeks and then we'll get back on our weekly um, our weekly process uh, once every week after summer vacation is over. All right, so take care, everybody.